Bona tarda a tothom. Si us plau, si aneu prenent seient. Molt bé, doncs encara que siguem una mica de retard, però començarem aquesta jornada. Avui és un dia bastant especial, vull dir, des d'Aus, aquest tema de la sensibilitat amb tots els temes de pobresa energètica, de tots els temes lligats d'alguna manera o altra amb la rehabilitació energètica, sabeu que és un dels nostres objectius, dels nostres tops que sempre estem intentant d'aprendre, de formar-nos i de conèixer què es pot fer, què s'està fent, no només aquí, sinó arreu del món, per anar millorant totes aquestes qüestions. Avui crec que tenim una jornada d'excepció aprofitant l'estada a Barcelona d'Ian Watson i John Reilly. Thank you, welcome. Us els presento molt lleugerament perquè després el Dani ja farà tot l'espig corresponent dels seus currículums i de les seves activitats. Ells dos són membres, són anglesos, són membres de l'associació BRE, que és una associació que es va fundar ja fa més de 100 anys a Anglaterra, i que ha sigut sempre, però ha estat sempre preocupada i treballant amb tots els temes d'eficiència energètica. Ja, per tant, estem parlant d'abans de la Guerra Mundial. Aleshores, després d'això, ells han sigut tenint l'activitat adaptant-se a les circumstàncies, primer en públics, després privats, tot això ja ens ho explicarà amb més detall el Dani, però en tot cas és una associació que està implantada a tot Anglaterra, que té un prestigi reconegut per tota mena d'administracions i de societats i, per tant, a ella se li encomanen tot el que són temes de gestió, aplicació, estudi de dades, de tot el que fa referència als temes d'eficiència energètica. I des dels últims anys, des dels últims anys em refereixo a partir dels anys 70-80, han sapigut lligar tot el que és l'eficiència energètica dels edificis amb un tema molt més ampli que és tot el tema de la pobresa energètica que en diem ara en el nostre país. És a dir, de quina manera totes les qüestions socials, els estatus socioeconòmics de les famílies, les seves condicions als habitatges, les seves condicions de salut, les seves prestacions que se'ls ofereixen, etcètera, etcètera, sanitàries, tot això de quina manera va lligat. El treball que ells desenvolupen és un treball, per tant, transversal, no és allò, uns fan una cosa i uns fan unes altres, que és una cosa a la qual estem malauradament bastant acostumats, sinó que han tingut la virtut de saber unificar totes aquestes activitats. Bé, jo no m'entretinc més perquè tenim la jornada llarga per endavant, però crec que el Dani ara mateix us explicarà un canvi d'ordre perquè precisament el que volíem és aprofitar l'estada aquí de l'Ian Watson i del John Reilly perquè no sempre els tenim l'oportunitat d'escoltar-los. El Dani i el Coque, amb tot el meu amor i amistat, els podem escoltar moltes vegades i els hi tornarem a demanar que ho facin. Per tant, moltes gràcies a tothom. Donem la benvinguda. Welcome to Ian and John. And I think that... I'm sorry because I couldn't speak at the same time. But... El motiu de... Bona tarda a tothom. El motiu del canvi, sobretot, és, primer, en època d'austeritat no tenim traducció simultània i, per tant, tot i que el que veureu és d'una claretat i d'una contundència formidable, tindreu que fer un esforç als que aquells, diguéssim, d'aquelles generacions que l'anglès, d'alguna manera, ens costa una mica més. I llavors ens semblava que, sobretot, ells no serien partíceps de la nostra presentació i que els costaria seguir-la i, per tant, hem preferit donar-li d'alguna manera a la volta, en tantes coses, perquè, com ja diu la Núria, sempre hi ha oportunitat de sentir-nos a nosaltres. Jo li he demanat també al Dani, que va ser la persona que va fer aflorar aquests noms, d'alguna manera que els faci una presentació i expliqui per què estan aquí dos personatges que venen d'Anglaterra explicant-nos coses de la pobresa energètica. Sí, després nosaltres farem la nostra presentació, diguéssim, del treball que hem fet amb l'agència 
catalana de l'habitatge amb el projecte Arrels, alguns dels quals coneixeu una miqueta, quina metodologia hem seguit, basant-se molt en idees que hem conegut dels seus treballs i l'aplicació en casos pilots directament. Sobre aquesta aplicació directa podrem fer llavors un debat final, però ens semblava que posar en context des d'un bon inici, a partir dels nostres, diguéssim, pares o els nostres herois, era interessant. Jo també aniria a Dani que presentés una mica la naturalesa dels treballs i dels personatges. Sí, llavors el bre, més o menys, de memòria, però es fonda el 1925, i inicialment treballen amb estructures, d'acer i sobretot de fusta, especialment que tenia rellevància durant la Segona Guerra Mundial amb els bombardejos, els que feien les proteccions del foc dels edificis durant la Segona Guerra, en tema d'economia de guerra. Tenen un campus de construcció de proves de 25 hectàrees, són 600 empleats, tenen uns beneficis de 4 milions d'euros a l'any, ja comencen a tindre delegacions amb altres continents però bàsicament durant aquest temps comencen a treballar amb eficiència energètica em sembla que des dels anys 40 però evidentment fins als anys 85 és una institució pública que treballa amb estructures, innovació eficiència i focs certificacions qualitat i de l'aire i llavors a partir de 1987 es privatitza i ens han de buscar una mica de l'aguda, la vida. Llavors una de les coses que fan és que tenien relació amb l'English Housing Survey que és com l'INE l'INE anglès llavors el que van fer és desenvolupar com uns plugins per utilitzar les estadístiques de l'Institut Nacional l'English Housing Service i donar-li valor afegit. Llavors la idea és que quan van començar a desenvolupar el sistema de certificació anglès, el SAP, la Standard Assessment Procedure, van agafar i van fer un plugin especial, que és que van linkar, reunir les condicions de l'edifici amb les condicions dels usuaris que hi ha en els edificis per caracteritzar per fer una caracterització híbrida edifici-habitatge. Una vegada van fer... Això no existeix a Espanya. Això és una cosa que se'ls va ocorrer fa 25 anys aquí. Encara no estan vincades les bases estadístiques de l'INE i l'IDAE. Quan van fer això, van implementar un plugin, evidentment, de recursos materials de les famílies, que és econometria, renta disponible de les famílies, i després, amb el temps, van incorporar altres coses que s'han incorporat recentment, que són qüestions de salut. Llavors, diguem que amb una enquesta reuneixen, fan la síntesi d'aquests quatre aspectes i llavors li permeten, li donen a l'English Housing Survey la possibilitat de crear uns indicadors específics a escala de nació i a escala de United Kingdom. O sigui, fan indicadors específics per Gales, per Escòcia, per Anglaterra i, si cal, genèrics per tot el Regne Unit. I amb això crec que ens he donat una primera vista. Sí, llavors el John el que ens explicarà és bàsicament la visió general, o sigui, és com treballen a nivell de gran, de big data, i quins indicadors produeixen i com ho fan, i llavors l'Aian és un especialista en... El John ens introduirà què és el SAP, la Standard Assessment Procedure, i l'Aian bàsicament és un especialista en sanitat i el que ens explicarà és com han desenvolupat i linkat coses que han fet a la pràctica, com a la ciutat de Liverpool, amb gran escala, com les estan incorporant amb aquesta nova generació d'indicadors que estan generant. Ok. Great. Uh, thank you very much for the introductions. Um, I am John Riley, as introduced, and uh, here today with Ian Watson. We're both from uh, BRE in the UK, um, an organisation just north of London. Um, today uh, we're going to talk to you about um, our work on energy poverty related to housing and health. Uh, I appreciate you are listening to this in another language, so if either Ian or myself are speaking too quickly, 
please just let us know and, and we'll try and address that. Uh, my background was initially in mathematics. Uh, I then moved into uh, the energy sector, did energy modeling, um, got interested in buildings, combined heat and power, and somehow they all got integrated when I moved to the BRE and I work on them all at once now. So an ideal job really for me. Talking a little bit about the BRE, it's a specialist research organization um, in the UK, which has about 600 staff in total. We research all aspects of the built environment. We're actually uh, a business, the BRE group, um, and we do make profits, but we're owned by a charity. And all of the money we make as profit is plowed back into charitable work or research work related to the built environment. And this includes um, activities at our BRE uh, university partnership centres. So uh, what we hope is that the original objective of setting up the BRE trust in the BRE was that we'd be able to put um, lots of good work into the built environment. The organisation is about 90 years old and we have um, bases in England, Scotland and Wales and some generally around the world but these are much smaller posts. Uh, today Ian and I have um, a few things on our mind, there are six uh, on the list here. I'm going to cover the first two where, where I talk about um, how we collect data that helps us develop policies around fuel poverty and then how we monitor progress. Uh, on determining how many people or how many households are fuel poor in the UK. It's going to be a double act then, and Ian will take over talking about how we tackle fuel poverty on the ground, more locally, whereas I'll have started off at a national level, and then talking about the costs and benefits of dealing with uh, fuel poor housing, and then a case study at the end. So the English Housing Survey uh, is actually a number of surveys. This is uh, where we collect information about the English housing stock. Uh, it's not just one survey, it's um, multiple surveys, as I said. Um, particularly, we have a, an interview survey where uh, surveyors go out to interview householders, and then once they've been interviewed by um, the interviewer, we have a physical survey which follows up, and we look at the building and uh, gather data about all aspects of the building. That's rather unique because we then combine the building data with the occupant data, and this is a very sound basis for generating fuel poverty statistics. We collect a lot of data in the survey, and um, we collect it to develop key indicators uh, for our customers, and our customers are usually um, national or local government. Uh, they need to know the energy efficiency of the housing stock, how it changes over time, how it might change over time if work is done on it. They're very interested in the levels of fuel poverty in the UK and England. And uh, in order to uh, set the baseline, the data comes from the English Housing Survey. Of course, we don't forget carbon emissions, which are also a central uh, part of po policy in the UK. There's plenty of other data. Um, when the English Housing Condition Survey started, um, it was originally about the condition of the housing stock. So we have lots of information collected in the survey about what, um, what the condition is of certain key elements of the house, repair to the, the doors, the windows, the roof, and so on. Lots of other data about the houses themselves, including amenity services and property value. Uh, where in the 90s and early 2000s the focus was was on UK carbon emissions and at that time and now we have around about 27% of the total uh, carbon emissions coming from the UK housing stock, that is space and water heating and lighting and appliances. Roughly 20% in total comes from uh, space and water heating. So looking at the English Housing Survey in a little bit more detail, it is the longest running national survey um, beginning in 1967 and running through to this day. It's changed since its original start. It used to be uh, conducted every five years with a very large sample. It's now conducted every single year with a continuous sample, but slightly smaller one. 
It's owned by the uh, UK Department of uh, Communities and Local Government, but delivered by us at BRE and some partners at NATSEN and MMBL. Uh, we do all the uh, methodology or develop the methodology for the survey and run survey tools and training. We also do the analysis and report back to government on the data and the data development. NATSEN, uh, our partners, go out into the field every year and interview 13,000 householders uh, about their incomes and all aspects of how they live in their house. MMBL then follow up on those and go and survey the, the dwellings themselves, 6,200 a year, uh, and they collect information on the dwelling type, the age, uh, the building materials, any insulation in place or any that has been added, the heating systems, and so on. In total, the uh, physical survey takes well over an hour, so it's quite comprehensive. And it's very consistent because it's done by the same surveyors year in, year out. We have a batch of about 150, uh, and they continually go out with the right methodology. Uh, the key results of the survey are published annually on the DCLG website, um, and the data set is used widely within government and outside of government. It's important that it's used across government because the, then the buy-in from everybody at the English and UK level in terms of its use. So it's, very, it's a very important survey for everybody in central government. Um, we have also condition surveys in other parts of the UK. England is just one quarter of it, really. Uh, we have Scotland, uh, Northern Ireland, and Wales. And together they make uh, a UK data set. We collect information for all of those countries. The main purpose, a uh, reminder really, is to provide our government with information about the UK and English housing stock. This information can help them develop policies so they know the condition of the stock, they know the, what's going on for the people, and they can develop policies to monitor and um, drive change in the housing stock for the people, to make the housing better for all. Uh, a quick overview of the English housing stock shows that there are some 22 million homes in England with 52 million people. 50% of the homes are 50 years or older and 22% are over 100 years. That indicates we've got quite an old housing stock and um, it started off in really poor condition. Some of it's improved and some of it has got worse. Generally speaking, we have um, 100,000 new homes provided every year and 20,000 homes demolished. This means uh, we've got a relatively slow rate of renewal. In fact, um, it's been calculated that homes will have to last about 1,000 years at the current rate of renewal. Uh, so it means really that the housing that we have today is the housing we'll have in the future, for, or at least for a long time. So we are stuck with it, and we need to make the most of it. So uh, government recognizes that and has put in place uh, a large number of programs to make the housing stock better. Uh, just some pictures here really to illustrate um, some of our housing showing mainly older buildings. Uh, the top, top slide shows you the pre-1850, what we call historic buildings in, in the UK at the moment. We have uh, three quarters of a million of these. Uh, the middle picture shows the Victorian homes. Um, built between 1850 and 1899, and we have around about 2.2 million of these. And then we have the Edwardian homes that came in the early 1900s, between 1900 and 1918. We've got another 2 million of these. So lots of diversity in the old stock itself. Uh, what might be considered very typical um, English and UK house is the semi-detached house. Uh, 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 a building which is split into two right down the middle on on the left side you see uh, a typical semi with um, nothing happening to it on the right side you see another typical semi which is being extended because um, the occupants try to make it fit for their purpose and it would have started off not big enough maybe not modern enough and maybe missing a few appliances so they have added these to it I think it sort of illustrates the point that these are the houses of the past, the ones we've got, but they're also the houses of the future because people will be living in these and um, modernising them for years to come, trying to make them fit the way they want to live their lives. Uh, this here shows a typical Victorian terraced housing street in the UK and in England. Uh, if you look closely, you'll see that many of them 
if not all of them, have changed their roofs, they'll have changed their windows and their doors, and modernized the inside. So although they started off in one way, they've certainly been changed. It still doesn't mean that they're exactly as people would wish to live in them, and I'm sure they'll undergo many changes in the future. Now our work, as I said, has uh, an important point. Collecting the information about the housing stock is to give us a good picture of what's going on, or give the government a good picture of what's going on, so that they can then use this information to drive change. And over the time, the time that the survey's been running, it's had a significant influence in driving some of that change. The first surveys in the 1960s and 70s showed quite clearly that there were many important things missing in the UK housing stock, particularly toilets, indoor toilets, or um, modern bathrooms and kitchens. The survey identified this, and the government, government took immediate action and developed uh, a series of grants so that people could um, apply for funds to modernize their buildings. And this was done. And uh, in the years that followed, we saw a rapid reduction in the number of houses without these basic amenities. Uh, other measures came in, and we talked later on in the mid-80s about fitness standards, a standard which would um, determine whether a house was considered fit to live in. And this was a very important standard that was uh, developed over time and uh, eventually uh, replaced by other standards. In uh, early 2000s came the Decent Home Standard, probably one of the most uh, influential standards, certainly in to terms of the social rented sector in the UK, uh, because it put in place a target to uh, achieve certain energy efficiency measures by 2010. And these energy efficiency measures were not too stretching, enough to be called basic measures and enough to be done and in the main they were done and it was a very successful program that um, certainly caused the energy efficiency of the housing stock to improve. Uh, talking about energy efficiency, we have um, in England and the UK uh, a measure of energy efficiency called SAP, our government standard assessment procedure for the energy rating of dwellings. You may be uh, familiar with this already. We run it on a scale from one, the least energy efficient to 100, the most energy efficient. Effectively, it's the cost to heat and light every square meter of your home. And when you get to 100, that comes down to zero. Uh, it's actually a, a notional measurement, meaning that it's got very, it's got standardized elements to it. Uh, we standardize the heating pattern, the length of time people heat, and the temperatures they heat to. We standardize climate, climate conditions, uh, regional components and the number of occupants. But under these standard conditions it works very well as a compliance tool because we compare houses very well across the regions and between the households and this is the basis for our current EPCs in the UK. Showing now uh, a chart here of the SAP, the energy efficiency for the housing stock for uh, the period 1996 through to 2013. And you can see that uh, on the whole, we've been improving our housing stock. And this is in part due to those important programs that were put in place because of information derived from the English Housing Survey. So it was very influential and we saw um, progress in the stock. Some of that may well have gone on anyway, but certainly the programs helped. Looking in detail, I can show you a series of slides here. This just shows you really that the newest homes uh, have the highest energy efficiency ratings and the oldest homes the, the worst, not surprising, but across all age types they've been improving in this period 1996 through to 2013. It's the same for our dwelling type, the type of building we have, whether it be a semi-detached, uh, a modern flat or a converted flat or even a detached house. Um, the, the most efficient ones tend to be those well-built purpose flats and uh, the least efficient ones tend to be the, the older um, and uh, bigger properties like bungalows. One of the main sources of our programs for improving the housing stock was the insulation program and this was implemented very effectively by uh, local authorities and by the energy suppliers. It was their um, uh, 
requirement, it was a requirement on them that they help develop um, work that would improve the energy efficiency of the housing stock. And you can see that insulation was uh, significantly improved in the time between 1996 and 2013. So turning now to fuel poverty, uh, because we have um, just introduced how we determine the energy efficiency of each property, and from that we can get a measure of how much energy and therefore the cost of the energy in the housing stock. Uh, but we need other information to make the fuel poverty calculation. Because fuel poverty is a compound um, indicator. It's a combination of poor energy efficiency, high fuel prices, and low incomes. And um, uniquely in the English Housing Survey, we have all of that information collected from the same survey at more or less the same time for the same households. So it's a very useful base data set. Uh, the government has set in place some targets for fuel poverty in, in England and the UK. Uh, the main target is that by 2030, uh, all fuel poor households will be in band C or above, uh, where practically possible. Uh, and they also have interim targets that by 2020, um, all band E properties, uh, fuel poor will be in all band E properties, and by 2025, they'll have it band D properties. So fuel poverty is a measure of one's ability to pay fuel bills, or perhaps more relevantly, inability to pay it. There was a previous definition in England and the UK called the 10% definition which was somewhat simpler than the current definition. So I'll just introduce this briefly before I talk about what we're doing now. Uh, generally speaking, if a household spent more than 10% of its income on fuel bills, it was considered to be fuel poor. So a basic calculation, the fuel poverty ratio was calculated from the fuel price times the fuel consumption in any particular house, divide that by the household income, and you get a ratio. If the ratio is greater than 0.1, that household was determined to be fuel poverty. Lots of people who use this like this indicator because it's quite simple to use uh, and quite easy to work out what's going on generally. But it had a number of drawbacks, and I'll come into those in a minute. But the new um, low income, high cost definition is a bit more complicated. Uh, it requires that the household has to spend, is fuel poor when it spends more than the median amount of um, money on its fuel bills. So it's got to be spending more than the average household on fuel bills. That's one element of it. But at the same time, it has to, when we take the, its household income and subtract the fuel costs, that amount has to be greater than, has to be less than 60% of the median income. So it's another composite indicator. Slightly complicated by the fact that each of the household groups has their fuel poverty, fuel spend equivalised, and their household income equivalised. But those are a bit too um, extensive to go into just here. Uh, quite simply put, um, the matrix there shows uh, the bottom left-hand corner, which is lowest incomes and highest energy costs. For fuel poverty um, targeting, this is where the government's most interested. So it's looking to, for energy efficiency to improve building regulations and use those to drive improvements to the housing stock, to put in place policies such as a green deal. This is uh, measures to encourage people to put uh, insulation measures and any other energy efficiency measures in their homes into, how, into houses, as well as um, heat strategy and other policies. On prices, uh, they are trying various measures to help customers switch from expensive suppliers to cheaper suppliers and tariffs, introducing smart meters and the warm homes discount. Uh, and on incomes, we have the universal credit and various working tax, working family uh, incentive payments. So fuel poverty is a composite indicator. And it, we're looking now at the basic principles for how we're calculating uh, energy consumption in the home. Essentially, it's just, and you probably know this already, a simple uh, balance of energy in versus energy out. We collect the information about the dwellings uh, and we determine what the heat loss would be from this dwelling. We add in um, the heat gains, either from internal gains from the appliances or the people, or external gains from the sun through the windows. And the difference 
Between that, we look at when we're targeting a certain heating regime. So we know what heating regime we have to achieve in the building, certain temperatures for certain periods, for a certain extent of the house. We balance that together, and we then get the demand for energy to heat the home. However, for our calculations for fuel poverty, we don't use SAP because SAP is standardized. So we use something called BREEDOM, which is the BRE's domestic energy model, and it helps us calculate approximately the real consumption in buildings. Not the actual consumption, but it's an approximate for it. But it's one that's used in the fuel poverty calculations. We still have all the data from the survey on the structure of the building and all of the systems in place to generate heating, cooking, lighting, and so on. Uh, it's a good indication of fuel cost, and it uses information about the occupancy. So here is where it differs from SAP. We do take account of the number of occupants. We do take account of the uh, type of occupant, whether they're young or elderly, whether it's a family or a single group. We also consider whether, um, what the exact fuel prices are and any specific climatic conditions for the dwelling from where it lives. So this allows us uh, an estimate for the fuel consumption and the cost of that, and we can take that into our affordability calculations. Uh, just simply put, all we're trying to do when we're calculating the total fuel consumption for the house is take the energy for the space heating, the energy for the water heating, energy for lighting appliances, and energy for cooking. We sum them all up, and that is our fuel poverty, uh, fuel consumption spend. Our heating regimes are, are not uh, simple. We actually have four heating regimes. So depending on how the household group is designated, i.e. whether it's a pensioner or whether it's a vulnerable person or a working family, we have four heating regimes. The full heating regime is where the house is heated all day, every day, for 16 hours a day. Uh, and this is for those elderly people that might be in every day. We then have a standard regime, which is the same as SAP, where we heat at weekends all day, but during the weekdays we heat for just nine hours. We then have two similar patterns, but they are for when the house is under-occupied. Perhaps an elderly person in the family home, all the family have moved away, they're now living in a large property that they don't need to heat the whole property, so therefore we have a, a partial tariff for these people. Uh, within it we set the temperatures, uh, which are based on SAP, and, and the heating characteristics are based on our information from the survey. There is a standard for, uh, called the bedroom standard, which we use to work out how much space any particular household group might have. The other side of the calculation for fuel poverty is the household income. Uh, in the interview survey, we ask all households very detailed questions about their income, whether they're on any benefits, uh, and what the benefits are and the levels of these benefits. Uh, primarily, we ask the question to the HRP. This is the household representative person, the person who is interviewed at the time of the survey. But we collect the information about them, them and their partner and work out the total household income from that. Things like any rent or housing benefits and mortgage uh, benefit payments received are added in. And this is, makes the total income that we have for the fuel poverty calculations. Uh, there are two income definitions. Uh, one, the fuel poverty full income definition. This is the one that's used for uh, the 10% threshold. And this is where we just have, as I said, the full income from the household, including any payments for mortgages or, or rent or council tax benefit. But for the low income, high cost, fuel cost um, element, we have to take off uh, housing costs, uh, and this makes it uh, a flatter indicator. Looking at the performance of fuel poverty, or look at, looking at how fuel poverty has changed over time from 1996 to 2012, uh, and the old indicator, you can see that it was uh, varying quite significantly. We started in 1996 with fuel poverty numbers at around 5 million households, and by 2004 it dropped to just over 1 million. This change over that time was due to the three factors, increasing energy efficiency, as you saw from the rising SAP, uh, reducing fuel prices and increasing incomes. Reducing fuel prices were probably the most significant factor 
over that time. And they were the cause of the change to the fuel poverty statistics in 2004 when they started to rise, and again when they started to decrease in 2009 2010. Uh, when looking at this chart, uh, the UK government uh, decided that the indicator was no longer fit for purpose. It wasn't doing what they needed. Um, it was too easily influenced by fuel price. It wasn't helping them develop their policy properly. So they undertook a review to determine a better way of doing this. Um, they also knew um, in the late 2008-09 period that their current targets for 2010 and 2016 to eradicate fuel poverty in all households was unachievable in this definition. So it was going nowhere. So they conducted a review and developed the low income high cost indicator, which had two main components to it. The first, the red line, was the uh, numbers of households considered, considered to be fuel poor. Because of the definition now, this is constrained by the median income. Uh, fuel poverty incomes are now in line with typical poverty indicators where they compare to the median. So it's much, much uh, more stable here. The blue bars show the fuel poverty gap and that shows the intensity of fuel poverty at any one time. This, when summed, is the total amount of money that would be required to take all households out of fuel poverty. So it's an important indicator because it tell, tells everyone how much uh, worse or better fuel poverty is getting. Uh, identifying the fuel poor in two ways, we look at the household characteristics and the dwelling characteristics. For the household, we can look at the uh, age or size of the main re reference size of the household group or the age of the main reference person. We can look at their disability benefits or other benefits and look at the way they pay for their fuel. All of these factors help um, us determine whether they're fuel poor or not. On the characteristic side of the building, we know that the age and type are key. Uh, they drive energy efficiency, but also levels of insulation, floor space, uh, efficiency of the boiler, and uh, tenure are key factors too. So it's important to identify these so that when people are going out to target fuel poor to help them, uh, we are in the right direction. Uh, this just chart just shows uh, some work done in 2007 where it compared the energy efficiency of the housing stock uh, from two, 1996 to 2007. You can see in 96 there's very few green high efficiency households and in 2007 there are more of them. But in 2007 we took the EPC work uh, and within that, in that you have recommendations for improvement for every particular dwelling. And we did some simulations to model these improvements. And, and that's the post-improvement chart at the bottom. Just to show what would be possible if many of the recommendations that are put out there at the time of the EPC were carried out. SAP, in the future, um, has to carry on improving. Uh, you've seen already that to the current day, around 200, 2013, we've seen good improvements. But if we're to reach our carbon targets, amongst others, uh, we've got to go much further than that. In fact, we've got to reach a SAP, a mean SAP for the whole stock of well above 80 by the time we get to 2050. Uh, we are uh, on the right line, but we have to uh, be cautious because we know that we've done a lot of the easy work, very cost-effective insulation measures which are cheap to install, quite easy to identify, and uh, are readily done by the householders. Many of the, the, the future works will be much harder to get installed in the housing stock. So reaching our, our targets by 2050, really we're concentrating the majority of our effort on the condition of the dwellings, the households. We're looking to improve the energy efficiency and uh, developing information from the English Housing Survey to help the policy steer the stock in the right direction. But to help get to the decarbonisation targets, we're going to have to <coughs> decarbonise the power supply, put in low carbon heat, uh, take on board huge advances in technology across the board, and most importantly, uh, engage the occupants, uh, make sure that their behaviour helps uh, the improvement of energy efficiency. There's plenty of challenges along the way, financial, of course, technical, uh, the scale of the job. Uh, there's so much work to be done uh, with more than 20 million properties. There's uh, a lot of work to be done. A lot of it is old. Uh, uh, but the bottom line, 
well, we need to get the occupants engaged with this. Uh, in many cases, we've had occupants in the past who have not wanted to take energy efficiency measures into the home uh, when they've been given to them. So we know there's a big challenge there and lots of work to do. Uh, that brings me to the end of my piece. I'll hand over to Ian now. So thank you for listening. Right. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Ian Watson. Um, I work with John at the, the, the BRE, or BRE. Um, having joined there just over um, a year and a half ago from local government, um, where I'm uh, an environmental health practitioner. Um, I'm not sure what the equivalent of that is in Spain, but the practice of environmental health is really about safeguarding the public's um, health, safety and well-being from hazards that may occur in the environment. So while I was working for local government, I specialised in housing, um, ensuring that private sector housing was up to um, a, d a decent condition. Um, and I also work with, with health, the, the, the NHS, um, to put, bring, put together a, a health, Healthy Homes programme, which, which I'll cover um, in my presentation. Um, I've probably got about an hour's worth of slides, so I think I may have to flick through some of these um, a bit more quickly. Um, but it, to, to give you a brief summary of how um, the, the, uh, fuel poverty is being tackled in the UK, both nationally um, and locally, um, it, it's worth considering this. Um, that is estimated that poor insulation results in one pound in every three pounds currently spent heating UK homes being wasted. So I think that there's what we widely accept that fuel poverty, as John says, is a, is a compound indicator um, caused by low incomes, high energy prices, and uh, low energy efficiency. But in terms of how the government can intervene, it's really uh, on the basis of improving energy efficiency. So the majority of fuel poverty is addressed through improving um, energy efficiency. One of the biggest programmes um, undertaken in recent years was the Decent Homes um, programme, which related to social rented properties. Um, this was introduced in, in 2001, um, and by 2010, over 888,000 homes had been made decent up, up to this standard. That standard being um, that, it, that those properties meet current minimum standards, so they're free from hazards or are fit to live in. They're in a reasonable state of repair, they have modern facilities and services, and also that they have a, a reasonable degree of thermal comfort. So that could be that they've got new boilers, sufficient insulation, um, and, and draft excluding, that sort of thing. Um, so a lot of properties have been improved through the, this programme, although it has been incredibly costly, um, estimated at about £37 billion. Pounds. Um, so as you can see from the scale of it, that's a, that's a pretty big, big program. In the last five years, another two big programs have been the CESP and CERT. Um, essentially, both these programs relied on the energy companies being obliged to reduce carbon dioxide emissions by improving um, the energy efficiency of, of domestic, particularly domestic properties. So, for example, under CESP, 293,000 measures have been installed to 154,000 properties, um, a large proportion of that being external insulation, so dealing with those perhaps older properties um, with solid walls or those sort of prefabricated local authority owned stock where it's very difficult to insulate the cavity. Um, and, and CERT is also worth mentioning um, in terms of delivery they've managed or we've managed to reduce our carbon dioxide emissions significantly um, and a component of that is actually achieved from um, improving the energy efficiency in these priority groups and super priority groups so those households who are um, deprived and on certain um, low income benefits. Current energy efficiency schemes nationally um, are the Green Deal um, this enables homeowners and businesses to implement energy efficiency improvements at little or no upfront cost, with the payment for those measures being recouped through a reduction in their energy bills. Um, so that's really the government's sort of flagship energy efficiency scheme. And then there's also the energy company obligation, um, which is three-pronged. And again, it's about improving energy efficiency through loft insulation, cavity wall, solid wall insulation, and also improving um, the energy efficiency of properties occupied by the vulnerable people, um, both in the rural areas, perhaps where there isn't gas, um, and also in more urban areas where they're living in more deprived uh, communities. In terms of local energy efficiency schemes, local authorities, um, it, 
have different problems depending on where they are. Some have problems with owners of older properties, perhaps in rural areas, um, and others, perhaps in more um, densely populated towns and cities, may have fuel poverty problems associated with, with, the, with young children living in private rented accommodation. Now, there's a range of initiatives that, that they can implement, from collective switching, um, where you perhaps have tens of thousands of local residents who are happy to switch together, allowing the local authority to approach the market to get the best value um, in terms of their energy tariffs. There's energy efficiency schemes, so really drawing on the, the, the finance from central government. Local energy generation, where the local authorities actually produce some, some of their own energy and are able to sell it at a discounted rate to, to vulnerable households. Ensuring that new build properties meet current building regulations um, for energy efficiency and also public health. Um, with the, the, there's been quite a, a reorganisation in, in, in England where the public health function of the NHS has moved into the local authority so it's more closely aligned with, uh, with, with, with the services within local authorities so it, it's better placed um, to, 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 well, to help improve health by improving energy efficiency. So there's a bit more funding available for those measures. The costs and benefits of dealing with poor housing in England is, is the next theme. Um, now, we were commissioned, the BRE um, was commissioned by central government back in 2010 to actually estimate the, the health treatment costs of people living in poor housing across England. Um, and at the time, we estimated that it cost the, NH, the, the National Health Service about £600 million per year. This has very recently been reviewed with new health treatment costs and also the latest data from the English Housing Survey, which is what I will we'll quickly go through now and report the findings of. Um, so to give you an idea about what we mean by poor housing, it's, we perhaps start on the other extreme. So this is what a good house perhaps would look like. This is a very new development um, of, of um, self-contained flats. If we look at the ground floor flat, it has central heating, double glazing, it's very well insulated. Um, there, are, there are guarding on, on the terrace there to reduce falls. There's no damp, there's no mould. It's the type of place where you'd be quite happy for a, an elderly relative to live because they're not really going to suffer uh, any harm from living within that property. By contrast, and in reality, there are an awful lot of houses across, across England um, that aren't in such good condition or aren't designed so well. Um, so here we've got a, a typical terrace property where access to the front door is from the pavement up the external stone staircase. So you can imagine if the weather was poor, if it was wet, or even perhaps in the winter when it was icy, it's going to be very hazardous um, to carry your shopping up to the front door. And so the risks of falls on the stairs are going to be very high. When you get into the home, there's a lot of damp and mould, so if, you're, if you've got a problem with asthma or respiratory problems, it's going to be exacerbated by those mould spores. And you probably wouldn't want to eat anything that's been prepared in that kitchen, um, because there's a very high risk of cross-contamination of food, and, and you're very likely to be, to, to, to be ill. Um, and so looking at that, you've got various, for, various hazards, whether they be falls on stairs, damp and mould, or, 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 or food hygiene. So that is what we would, we would classify as, as, as a poor, poor home. Um, we've carried out quite a bit of research to identify the implications of these poor homes and really appreciate that the implications go further than just to the health service, um, that there can be wider effects to, to, to society, whether it be to, to crime, um, environmental targets, or, or community stability. Um, so the, 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 the home plays a real central role in contributing to a, a whole load of wider, wider agenda. To try and illustrate the, the connection of health and housing, um, I've got two graphs on this slide. The, the one on the left shows excess winter deaths, so that's the, the, the extra deaths that occur in the winter months compared with the summer months. And as you can see from 1950 down to 2010, there's been quite a big reduction. And next to that, we have the number of homes lacking central heating. And again, there's been a big reduction in that. So there is a correlation or a relationship between a reduction in excess winter deaths and, and homes lacking central heating. Um, 
obviously you would expect to see perhaps more excess winter deaths in or the deaths in winter than summer months. Um, but if you compare the rates in, in England compared with other countries of similar climates, it's much higher uh, in England, which suggests it is uh, related to, to housing conditions. Unfortunately, it's still quite high. There are still between 25 and 30,000 more deaths occurring every winter, um, despite the, those Im improvements that we've um, achieved in energy efficiency, um, with, with fuel poverty now being suggested a, 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 as one reason for that, where people can't physically afford to adequately heat their homes. Another way to illustrate the relationship is if we look where accidents are most likely to occur. So after leisure, um, the home is by far the most common place for injuries um, to occur, so much more than transport or uh, in the workplace, um, which, which co can come as quite a surprise to a lot of people, particularly when you think of where a lot of money is invested in, in preventative uh, works. Um, I think we've already seen that, that slide for, for, from John, um, but essentially what we're saying is uh, that the homes that we've got in the current housing stock are there to last an awful long time, so it's really important that we know where the hazards are, how many, they are, how many there are, and how we can go about uh, mitigating those to prevent ill health from occurring. So in, in, in the UK, we have what's called the Housing Health and Safety Rating System, which is a bit of a mouthful. Um, but it allows us to evaluate the risk to health, safety and well-being um, of, of defects within the home. So there are 29 different hazards that are assessed um, and they range from cold and falls through to, to water supply, personal hygiene, no noise and lighting. It's quite a comprehensive way to assess how the condition of a home can affect the health and safety of, of the person living in the property. Um, where there is a high risk um, that is what we, what we would say um, is a poor home. Um, so I'll just briefly explain how the system works. It requires two assessments. Firstly, an assessment of how likely the, 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 uh, a vulnerable person would be um, to suffering ill health over a 12-month period from being exposed to the condition of that home. And the second assessment is if they do um, suffer ill health, how severe will that, that harm outcome be? Um, so those two assessments are made. There are figures that are generated from this assessment uh, mechanism. And they're put into a, into a formula and, uh, it, it, which generates a score. If that score is 1,000 or more, then it's a Category 1 hazard, and that's, what we, uh, that's how we define a poor, poor home. So a poor home is somewhere where you're quite likely, or a vulnerable person is quite likely to suffer ill health over a, a short period of time. Um, so in terms of... England, we've got 3.4 million homes that contain one of these serious housing hazards, the most common being for falls on stairs and cold homes. So falls and cold homes are the most common hazards that we experience across the housing stock in England. In terms of the cost to put those hazards right, um, again, with findings from the English Housing Survey, we estimate that this would be in the region of £10 billion, which is quite a serious sum of money, uh, with excess cold being the, the, the greatest uh, contribution to that, at just over £6 billion. Um, and as John mentioned earlier, it's mainly now because those low-hanging fruit, those, those properties that are easier to mitigate, have been found and dealt with, and so we're now perhaps left with the, the more difficult uh, homes to, 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 to improve. Um, so we're getting a good idea of the, the scale of um, substandard or poor housing across England and the amount of money it would cost to put right. Um, the English Housing Survey also pr provides us with a profile of uh, costs to mitigate hazards. And as you can see from that graph, it does vary quite considerably. This is very useful when, we, when we're looking to target um, the more, more cheaper hazards to remedy because there's a better uh, rate of return um, on, on our investment for doing that, which I'll touch on shortly. So the other side of the equation is how the, the actual health costs um, to treat the, the harmful events that are likely to occur if someone suffers ill health from uh, property-related hazards. So what we've done is for each of the 29 different hazards, we've identified the likely health impact for those four different classes of harm, for the, so those four different severities of harm, ranging from one being the most severe down to class four being the least severe but still uh, necessitating a, a medical intervention. We've spoken to the health service 
to identify how much it would cost per year to treat someone uh, with, with those injuries. Um, so we know how many hazards there are in the English housing stock and we know how much it costs to treat individual harmful events. So what we're able to do is estimate the cost to the health service from treating um, residents every year in England from, sub from poor housing. Um, so that totals about £1.4 billion, pounds, um, with the greatest uh, contributor being from excess cold and then falls. Um, this also allows us to then compare the cost to the NHS or the health service with other risk factors. Um, and as you can see from this table, poor housing is, it, it is actually more than physical inactivity. So it starts raising some questions um, about where the best uh, use of, of funding perhaps should go. Um, what we can also do, in addition to, to look at the, the poorest housing, we can also add in the, the costs of treatments uh, for, for these houses containing Category 2 hazards, so the less severe hazards, um, and also those houses um, that perhaps don't meet current building regulations. So if we were to expand upon the, the estimates um, and wanted to bring up all properties up to current building regulations, it would save the NHS £2 billion pounds per year. Um, there are other costs to society um, that we recognise, um, and that's the, the, the subject of uh, the further study at the moment. Um, we've also developed a cost-benefit tool, as we cannot find £10 billion pounds to go out and fix every hazard in the home um, across England to save the NHS £1.4 billion. Pounds. So we're a, we, we've developed a cost-benefit tool um, which uses the costs provided through the research to apply to different scenarios for action. So we can look at what the payback period would be for, for example, mitigating all falls on stairs hazards. And so you can just see from the graph here that if we were to invest £2 million in year one, there would be a return on that investment by year six, where the, the, the savings to the NHS would outweigh the initial um, uh, investment to, to mitigate that hazard. And we're able to do that nationally for a local authority level and also individual housing uh, hazards. So here we have a falls on stair hazard. Um, it's a, a serious hazard because obviously there's no balustrade. Um, to, to reduce the risk of someone falling from those stairs would cost about £314. Um, and we estimate that would save the NHS statistically £146 per year. So the payback period from that intervention would, just, would be just over two years. Um, we've also got a number of case studies. So, for example, here, this is the, the cost benefit in some energy improvements. We've got an, a mid-terrace house, which is, has solid, uninsulated stone walls, some double glazing, a small amount of roof insulation, off-peak storage radiators, and an electric immersion heater. It's currently costing the, the occupier almost £1,000 a year to heat, um, and there's a serious risk in there from excess cold, and the householder currently is in fuel poverty. If we invest £3,500 to put in a condensing gas boiler and radiators, we top up the loft insulation and complete the double glazing. That improves the energy efficiency, it over halves the uh, annual fuel cost and it reduces the risk of the occupier suffering ill health from cold and it actually lifts the person out of fuel poverty. So there's potential cost savings there to the NHS of just over £500 per year giving a payback period of just over five years. So you, you, it, this, this research actually helps to put a business plan together for individual housing improvements. Um, so that methodology is used for local authority level, where we, are, where we can estimate the, uh, the number of properties containing these hazards and estimate the number of med uh, medical interventions that would be avoided should they um, mitigate the hazards. And we can also provide information about the cost of repairs. Just whiz through this. Um, we can do some cost-benefit scenarios where we start looking at the 20, the cheapest or least expensive 50% or 20% of hazards to mitigate for the different hazards. Um, and so, if we look at the least expensive hazards to mitigate, that will of course give us a, a shorter payback period, so it makes some hazards more attractive to mitigate than others. Um, and then we also produce a, a tool that allows local authority officers to put the information of individual property inspections into the system and that will estimate the, the savings to the NHS and wider society from those individual property improvements which again 
helps them justify their existence. Right, um, I'll quickly go through the case study, the Liverpool case study. Um, <clears throat> before I joined the BRE, um, I was the programme coordinator for the Liverpool Healthy Homes programme, which was a, which is a joint programme between the Health Service and the City Council. If you haven't been to Liverpool before, this is what it looks like if you're on the other, so, other side of the water. Um, oh, I don't know what's happened with the formatting here, but um, to give you a, a, a bit of information about Liverpool, it, it's a, it's a good-sized city. It's about the sixth largest in England with a population of over 460,000. There are 150,000 private sector properties, and according to the last stock condition survey that was carried out, there are over 19,000 that present a health and safety risk, so contain these Category 1 hazards or poor housing, as we've spoken about earlier, with the most common hazards for cold, falls, electrical safety and fire, big problems with energy efficiency, the map there on the right-hand side shows the distribution of fuel poverty rates across Liverpool, um, and it ranges from about 7% in the least deprived areas up to about 41 42% in the most deprived areas. Um, the private rented sector, so that's where tenants rent from a private landlord rather than social housing, accounts for the highest rates of hazardous housing and the poorest thermal efficiency. Liverpool also has the highest mortality, among the highest mortality rates and lowest light levels of life expectancy in the UK, and it has large life expectancies, uh, health inequalities, which can be um, illustrated by this. The, the, this plan shows a, a transport uh, map of Liverpool with life expectancy for each of the different wards. Um, so if you were to travel from um, the church ward here up to Picton there, which is only about three or four miles up the road, there is a difference in life expectancy of uh, over 10 years. Um, so there are big health inequalities within Liverpool. And then if you compare the average life expectancy of local residents to the rest of the UK, again, there, there, there are big gaps there. So in terms of housing and health, um, every year in Liverpool, there are 280 more deaths in the winter than the summer months. And um, we also estimate that for each winter death, there are eight emergency hospital admissions. So again, it's starting to, to paint a picture of the, the demands on the health service from, from, from cold-related ill health. We also estimate that accidents in the home cause 70 deaths and 4,000 hospital admissions per year in, Liverpool, in, in Liverpool. <coughs> so overall, and to summarise, we estimate that poor housing conditions are implicated in about 500 deaths and around 5,000 illnesses we require medical attention each year in Liverpool. So in terms of commissioning drivers, why there, were, there was a need to do, to do something? Well, I think the statistics speak for themselves, um, but we were, we, we, there, there, there was a high level objective to tackle these health inequalities, so deal with that social injustice of people dying earlier um, in neighbouring streets compared with other streets. There was the, the Joint Strategic Needs Assessment, which is the um, strategic tool which identifies local health needs um, and informs commissioning priorities that recognised the importance housing had to play in tackling health inequalities by improving um, the energy efficiency of properties and tackling damp homes. Um, and we were provided with this housing health and safety rating system that allowed us um, to evaluate the, the effect housing has on the health of the residents and also enforcement tools so it, local authority enforcement officers could require private landlords to effect improvements where those Category 1 hazards were, were identified. So we were given a lot of money from uh, the health service to deliver this programme, um, and it was, it was done on a large scale, so to identify over 25,000 properties in priority neighbourhoods, so those neighbourhoods experiencing the greatest deprivation and the poorest health. In, ident in going out and visiting residents in those areas, we assessed the health and housing needs of each occupant, so it wasn't just about improving the physical environment people live in, it was also looking at what their individual health needs were and providing access to a wide range of health and wellbeing related services. We carried out um, health and safety inspections of the worst houses um, and required landlords to, to effect improvements where necessary. And we also carried out some home safety promotion um, to, to, well, targeting uh, vulnerable people who we identified or defined as the under 11s and over 65s. And so the programme ambitiously um, aimed to reduce premature deaths by up to 100 
and reduce GP consultation, yeah, these are uh, doctor consultations and hospital admissions by over a thousand cases. So this gives you a bit of a, a better understanding of how it worked. So after a period of um, promotion, we would actually hit the streets. So these were the advocates who went out there and spoke to residents in those deprived neighbourhoods. Um, normally they'd go in through the front door and actually conduct the survey within the home, um, but they carried out over 20,000 um, these surveys, making over 28,000 referrals to a whole range of partner organisations to deal with anything from um, being registered with a, with a doctor to assistance with, with, with dental uh, problems, alcohol and drugs, smoking cessation, lifestyle, careers advice, really anything that contributed to those health inequalities in Liverpool, we provided access to a service that could help the residents um, address the, the, those health problems. In terms of housing conditions, um, over 5,500 inspections were carried out, identifying over 4,000 of those serious housing hazards that could, could, could affect health. By requiring landlords to carry out improvements, rather than us paying for the improvements ourselves, we estimate that that levered in about over five million pounds of private sector investment, which supported about 30 construction jobs uh, in the city. And social housing providers weren't overlooked as we looked, uh, as we visited every home in a street where we came across social landlords, we had a, a more expeditious route of referral uh, because the, you, there's a bit more trust and reliability with, with, with social landlords, but um, so we made over 1,800 referrals to their, their, their providers. These are the most common hazards that we identified through this approach, uh, with excess cold, fire, damp, and mould being the most common. Um, and, some, and these are some of the photographs of the living conditions that we experienced when we actually went out there and knocked on doors. Um, so this, no doubt, you've got some similar. Um, that you're not aware of here. Um, we also work with landlords to provide information about key health contacts, encourage landlords to carry out their annual gas safety checks, um, and we also contributed to, or work with other departments within the local authority who are having problems with criminal landlords, um, and by, by working together we were able to have greater impact on dealing <coughs> with them. Um, we also contributed to uh, carbon monoxide awareness, child accident safety campaigns, falls prevention campaigns, and also winter survival campaigns, which were perhaps one of our biggest. Um, so you can just see here on the bottom right, this is a leaflet we produced every year. It went out to 65,000 uh, households across Liverpool that, that were occupied by someone over the age of 60, providing information about how to keep warm, can keep well in the winter months, and also listed uh, contact details of organisations who could help them improve their energy efficiency or their income. Um, in addition to that proactive um, side of going out into neighbourhoods, we also work very closely with clinicians, so health uh, professionals um, who could re uh, refer vulnerable patients who are living in poor homes to us, um, and that was pretty effective. We also piloted an emergency accommodation project where if, if, if patients weren't allowed to leave the hospital because of the condition of their home was so poor, we could put them, them up in this temporary accommodation while we resolve the, the, their housing problems. Um, and if you, in, if you again look at the business case for that, it costs over £1,700 uh, for a hospital bed per week uh, compared with our sheltered unit, which was £192 per week. So I think the figures speak for themselves. In terms of an evaluation, um, at the time, I commissioned the, the building research establishment to carry out a health impact assessment of what we'd done, and they estimated that the, that the total savings to wide society from, from our impacts were £55 million, which is a very good return on the, the original investment of £6, six million pounds for the Healthy Homes programme. Um, so in summary, we were able to tackle the underlying causes of fuel poverty through those various, those various interventions. Um, and Liverpool, I mean, we, I can't say that our programme uh, in isolation was responsible for this, um, but in Liverpool that there's been a big reduction in health deprivation and there's been a bigger reduction in excess winter deaths than the, the regional average. Um, so no, no doubt we'll have had a part to play in, in actually achieving that. Um, so I think that just leaves me to say really that um, it does actually cost um, to do nothing. So to, by leaving people in the substandard housing, um, there is actually a big cost um, um, to that. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you.
Eh, bueno, la verdad es que costa. Eh? Eh, después de ver una presentación como esta, la costa torna a nuestro país, ¿no? Eh, costa una miqueta, y incluso fa una mica de vergüenza eh, explicar lo que hacemos por aquí, ¿no? Yo eh, creo que el ejemplo que nos han presentado es eh, un, un, un ejemplo de cómo se han de hacer las cosas, ¿no? O si sea, eso o nos lo prenem en serio o, o la cosa no funciona, ¿no? Yo eh, agradezco la, 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 la esfuerzo salvatge de, de contrición que han hecho a la hora de explicar eh, la seva presentación, ¿no? las políticas o todo el trabajo que han hecho, un trabajo de diagnosi excelente a partir de, de una, una base de dades espectacular, de una trayectoria, de unas ideas claras, y evidentemente a partir de esta diagnosis fantástica, unas políticas consecuentes y, y a veces a una realidad eh, económica siempre presente. ¿no? En aquel sentido, me em parece que es exemplar. Y de alguna manera, cuando el Dani va a descubrir una mica tota que tan bit, fa uns anys, en el marc del nuestro proyecto de Rails, nos va a semblar que eh, utilizar el ejemplo eh, de nuestros amigos anglesos eh, a molta petita escala eh, sería, eh, de alguna manera, la, la manera de comenzar, como mínimo, un proyecto que fuese integrador, que a mí me parece que es lo más interesante de, 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 de la seva experiencia. No? No, no están hablando de salud, no están hablando de habitación, no están hablando de asistencia social, están hablando de todo alhora. Eh? Aquí, diguéssim, encara las puertas eh, pues, eh, son unos muros bien gruixuts y costa muchísimo transitarse de forma transversal. Cuando eh, vas a Vitacha explican parlant cosas de salud, digo que es una otra puerta, cuando vas a salud digo que Vitacha es etc. etc. No? Y vos en aquel sentido, que te ejemplo integrado, de una mirada sobre esta complejidad, em me parece que es eh, indispensable y no? absolutamente pertinente, amb un pragmatismo muy inglés para otra banda, no? que a veces a nosotros ens, ens costa identificar y después hay unas dotaciones económicas y una, una manera de abordar los problemas eh, rigurosa y seriosa. No? En fin, no sé, si voleu fer si alguna pregunta las tenemos aquí, es una buena oportunidad, ¿no?, en aquel sentido. Y yo diría que, encara que sigui breu y que la nuestra participación sigui molt més de rodida, yo creo que val, que val la pena aprovechar. No sé si alguien quiere algún comentario o algo. Sí, bueno, a ver, porque no se ha visto muy bien, pero mmm, se habían compromiso a ver si podían reducir los morts en 100 y los han reducido en 160, o sea, hay una reducción de los morts del 50%. Por tanto, hay una reducción de los costos sanitarios del 50%. Eso son 1.000 millones de euros al año. A Cataluña serían 100 millones de, de, de euros al año, cada año. Aquí, los propios 50 años, pues son números. Eso son los resultados. Uh... Pero para arribar a aquests resultados, pues se han tenido que hacer un, un, una, una, una actuación a gran escala, miles de rehabilitaciones, para tener números consecuentes. Eh, y de arriba de eso, para poder arribar a convencer a la administración para que se invertís en miles de rehabilitaciones concentradas en una zona y en un survey del National Health Service, para demostrar que eso pues, tenga que estar Sanitaris, pues evidentemente este que actúa desde dalt de todo, desde, desde el INE, desde el Instituto Nacional de Estadística, y agafan creuan estadísticas de unos y unos otros. Eso lo han podido hacer, porque tienen el prestigio y el recurso que tienen, pero eso a España y a Cataluña no se puede hacer. Sencillamente las dadas estadísticas no se pueden creuar, por tanto no pueden aseverar que eso es posible. Vale. Cuando lo hacemos, y lo hacemos durante temps y en todos estos estudios y en estas aquests miles de entrevistas y estas dadas y tal, hacemos las acciones y después miren lo que pasará, pues ahora nos pueden testificar los resultados y ahora vamos a nuestro servicio sanitario, que es un tercio del presupuesto de Cataluña, su creura. Yo creo que eso es la gran demostración. Y a partir de aquí... Bueno, no sé si hay alguna pregunta porque si no... Por aquí. Uh, si la puedes hacer en inglés, te lo agradeceríamos. Sí. Uh, quería felicitaros por la, estas iniciativas y por traer a esta gente aquí. Hola. Sí. Bueno, felicitar a la agenda de AUS y sobre todo al Dani uh, para ver estas iniciativas de convida que estos eran aquí, que es un, un play y un luxo. Y eh? uh, well, thank you guys for the for the lecture. It was uh, really amazing. And uh, I was impressed for, for the work, not just for the detail, but also for the extension of these programs. And uh, 
uh, as you know, in, uh, in our country, we still don't have this kind of structures uh, at all. So uh, could you please explain how, uh, how, what is the relation, because the BRE, uh, as I understood, was a charity institution. Is that correct? Uh, well, originally not. We, originally it was a research institution uh, that then became part of uh, government. And in 1997, it was privatized. And at that point, the best way of handling the organization with the, the goals that it had was to uh, wrap it all up into a group and then have a charity own that group. So it could fund or channel all of the profits back into the built environment. Okay. And uh, where do you get this, the foundings to, to make all the rehabilitation of the, of the buildings? And what is your relationship with, with the public uh, institutions, administrations? Okay, well, the, um, at national level, uh, are, we are um, contractors to central government, to the big departments like the Department of Energy and Climate Change or communities and local government. They, they need to develop their policy, they need to understand the housing stock first before they consider what policy they'll develop and put in place. And once they have got a policy developed and in place, they need to monitor it to, to ensure that it's going in the right direction. So uh, we are paid directly by central government to um, continue and manage programs of work like the EHS that collect data, do the analysis, and then report findings back. Okay, and, and once you have uh, collected all the data and you, you start to show up some results and some conclusions, uh, how, uh, who assumes the cost of the, of, the, of the work itself? If it's public uh, social housing or if, is it, uh, if it is uh, private housing, how, where the, the money comes from at the end? No? Okay, well, I guess at one level, the national level, it's a question of different policies for different objectives. Uh, in, in some cases, uh, the money is found from central government. Uh, perhaps, um, as in the Decent Homes Programme, a lot of that came from the central, central government funding was delivered locally. Um, but much of the work done through ECO, the Energy Commitment, um, and uh, CERTs and previous programs of work like that have actually been um, effectively implemented by the energy suppliers. Government has required them to deliver certain objectives in terms of energy efficiency improvements to the housing stock. And it requires them to do it. They fund it. Uh, through a levy contained within fuel bills. So, Can you repeat it? They fund it through a...? They fund it through a charge on fuel that, okay. is, not, that is not visible, but it is there. So when you buy electricity and gas, the heating and lighting, there is an element of that that goes into this fund that comes back to them, energy suppliers, to pay for all of these measures. And they are large, very large programs of measures. They're, they're putting in hundreds of thousands if not millions of installations. Uh, well, uh, it's not. It could be some some kind of uh, double interest to that an energy company mm -hmm. that expects and have benefits from. Well, you know the, the question. No? Uh, from selling energy is the one that on the other side uh, is taking in charge the renovation. How do you solve this conflict? Um, I'm not sure exactly what you mean. I guess it, it's somewhat of a contradiction, isn't it, that an energy supply company would be reducing the sale of their product. Is that what you mean? That, that, uh, yeah, because at, at the end, if the energy company that is uh, founding the, the efficiency, energy efficient, yeah. no, so it, it might have an impact on their own benefits. Well, it, it certainly has an impact on the amount of electricity or gas they sell because the measures, when in place, are intended and, and in do, doing cases, reduce consumption. But the fact remains that they're required to do this by central government. They have targets that they must hit. If they don't, they are penalised with much bigger fines. So it is absolutely not in their interest to not deliver to the targets. And in fact, we've seen over the many years that these programmes have been in place that they've always generally tended to exceed their targets. They've gone about it 
very efficiently, not just and effectively, not just in generally getting improvements into the housing stock, but getting them into the priority groups, those groups of households that are considered vulnerable, because they get additional credits for um, ensuring that improvements are delivered to the vulnerable groups. So although it might seem at first that this is something that the, the energy companies wouldn't put their heart into, one is they actually have to do it, and they're fined heavily if they don't. Okay, well, thank you, and congratulations for, for your work. Oh, you're welcome.